Blog Talk Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of The Period Party. Uh, this is Nicole, and I'm here with Krista Arecchio, a clinical and holistic nutritionist and the founder of thewholejourney.com. Hi, Krista. How are you? Hi, Nicole. I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm excellent. I am super excited to talk to you today. I feel like I've been through your book and there is so much to, to go through. <laughs> I wish we had more than 30 minutes, but you know, we'll, we'll rock it out as you said. So um, on this uh, episode, we're going to be talking about fertility and preconception and the buildup of that and the detox part of that, as well as, you know, why you should be doing this. Um, also, you know, how, you know, how do you, sort of assess where you are and where you need to be in terms of evaluating your current lifestyle if you're trying to get pregnant or want to get pregnant, uh, the kinds of things you should add in, things you should eliminate, as well as uh, prenatal supplements, whether we should or should not take those, and then, of course, advice for after you get pregnant. Um, so, yeah, we should, we should get right into that, shouldn't we? Let's do it. Okay. Um, so right. where do you yeah, want go to for it. start? Preconception? Oh, well, I mean, my, you know, it was so interesting just like in the beginning of your book, reading about, uh, you know, this idea that you relate a baby to a seed and what was the soil like before that seed was there? And this idea that we don't really think about that at all. I mean, like you said, looking at uh, a pregnancy from just that, 40 week gestation period is is not a complete way to look at pregnancy and I think I would love for you to speak to that because I think that we we view it a little uh, maybe as an incomplete thing right now currently yeah that and that's the primary reason Nicole why Willow and I wrote how to conceive naturally is and we, we were having dinner one night, and she was getting ready to prepare six months in advance for them wanting to conceive their first <laughs> child. And um, I know that's quite far in advance, but we were really talking and saying, you know, isn't this period, because what you do in the three months before you conceive a child, that's contributing so much to their health in their adult life. And to us, mm-hmm. that is just as important, if not important than saving for college education or for all those things that we really plan for with a baby. We plan the the baby room and we get all this stuff and we start shifting (laughs) our life, but really kind of preparing for their health, you give them a totally different experience of life. And this is where we have the power to use the up and coming field of epigenetics to create truly a new generation of children that they don't have to get any predetermined diseases or disorders that have come in previous generations because now we've done the preliminary work to contribute a better genetic code to our children. It's so huge. I mean, when you think about how vast that is, there's, there's so much you could share about it, I'm sure. But to me, that's like a whole other paradigm that we're looking at right now. And I I think it's so promising and, and so incredible. It really is. And like you said, we use the, the seed, the seed and the soil analogy because it's, it's so true that when you're wanting mm-hmm. to plant a garden, vegetable or whatever you're going to eat is only going to be as high of quality as the soil it was grown in. And so that's the exact thing is you're tilling your soil. And for moms especially, you're going to have a much better pregnancy. You're going to be able to enjoy it. You're going to have more energy. You'll sleep better. You'll still want to exercise during the pregnancy and you'll enjoy that postpartum period instead of kind of feeling like you got hit by a truck and wondering what happened, right? We really, that's such a magical time. Those, those few, first few months, especially becoming a new mother, it is for whenever any child's born, but it's like to really be present with this major life shift that you just created a new life. And that's really the point and purpose of, of why we put this together. Oh, for sure. I know. I love that. And I feel like, you know, this is something that I've been aware of for so long, but I've mentioned it to some women and and they've never really heard of this concept. So why, you know, how do you do that? How do you assess uh, where you are and, and, you know, what's going on with your body currently and, and, and how to get to the point where you're, you know, quote unquote, baby ready, ready to start uh, trying to get pregnant? 
Right. Well, in, in the book, we have an assessment that you fill out, or we also mm-hmm. give away the first chapter for free on how to conceive naturally.com where you can take the assessment and you start to evaluate, okay, what is your current lifestyle like? Are you exercising? How many times have you had antibiotics through the course of your life? Because that is key and so crucial. And I have been eating, sleeping and breathing the microbiome and really repairing the digestive health and immune health with the microbiome to lay a platform for all of health. And a lot of the success I've had with fertility has come from finding the root cause of the microorganism in the body and getting the genetic code balanced. So we're trying to figure that out in the assessment and we're looking at other lifestyle habits. You know, how much sugar do you consume? Are you currently taking supplements? Um, Trying to figure out the health of the adrenals with sleep and moods. And so we're trying to get Uh, an idea between like lifestyle and what people have been through to say, okay, these are a couple of tracks that you can go down. Some people don't have to be as vigilant and some people have a little more cleanup work to do to prepare for it. And it depends on right, age. Of course. You know, originally we wrote this book for um, for women in our in their late thirties and early forties because my practice had taken that bent, and I, I was not a fertility specialist. I was a, a general health counselor and nutritionist, and knew a lot about the digestive health and hormones and the immune system. But I started getting all these women who have been through, you know, six rounds of IVF in the last six years, which is such an emotional journey and so hard on the body. Yeah. And still, you know, they're coming to me saying, this is my last shot. I've been to all of these doctors. I've been to all these nutritionists. Nothing is working. I, I really need to know if I need to let this go or is this going to work? And so you have to assess, you know, what someone's been through, the journey their body has taken, their emotions, all of that, to give them a good starting place. Mm. That's so wonderful. I mean, I really liked that you decided to uh, have, you know, in the book that having a healthy pregnancy after 30, and you included that because I think that a lot of people don't realize that even just early 30s, there are quite a few issues for women. I've had the same thing happen where so many women have come to me in their 20s and they've been through IVF. And so, yes, there is an age component to it, but there's also a humongous lifestyle factor contributing to, to women's infertility as well. Well, we're living in a different world now, and we have a lot more environmental toxins that are affecting our body, and our food supply has really degraded so much in the last 20 years, more so than it has in the last 100, and um, Mm -hmm. back when... I was finishing up high school. That's when GMOs started really getting on the scene, genetically modified right. organisms. And I'm going to give them a lot of the blame for this epidemic of modern infertility. You know, we have 11 times the number of fertility clinics we had in the U.S. alone than we had before this mass proliferation of specifically genetically modified corn and soy. Now we're putting it into the entire food supply. They are testing women. They're testing their finding. The, the toxin from BT, BT toxin from genetically modified corn in the blood of pregnant women in their fetuses. And then there have been studies on lab rats where when they're consistently fed a diet of genetically modified corn, these lab rats within three generations lose the ability to reproduce at all. And so that is a stunning statistic and we realize how our food supply has changed so much and we're getting all of these sneaky GMOs in places we would never think that we're getting them. So that's my Mm -hmm. advice to all of you guys listening. Try your very best to look for the non-GMO project stamp on the things that you're buying. If you eat corn, it hands down must, must be organic and you want to avoid soy at all costs, especially if you're trying to get pregnant. I'm not a fan of unfermented soy in any way, shape, or form. And so, and the the biggest portion too now is this changes your gut bacteria dramatically. You start producing toxins and now your body and your microorganisms, which there are 10 times more microbial cells in the human body than there are human cells. We need to make peace with these guys. We can't have them working against us. If they're working for us, things really start to happen and we get positive changes in the body. If they're working against us, you're fighting an uphill battle. And so 
that breaks my heart to see women feeling like they're doing all of the right things and then not getting the results because this is this underlying chemistry war that's happening that they're unaware of. Oh my goodness. I mean, I could not agree with you more. I feel that we it, we are absolutely living in a different world. I mean, in addition to the food side of things, we're also under assault constantly because there are so many chemicals just in our general environment, whether it's in our house or in our workplace. I mean, and then in our personal care products, it's just continual. And there are so many people who are saying, oh, those things don't actually do anything to you. Our bodies are meant to do that. So I'm curious about, uh, you know, what, when it comes to doing this, you know, the 12-week detox that you recommend, uh, what are some of the things that you suggest people remove aside from the genetically modified foods and the other things you mentioned? Okay, so I'm taking all the fun away, but it's just temporary, right? <laughs> and it's just to get balance within the body. So, yeah, we want to get rid of the GMOs at all costs. You want to get rid of genetically modified corn and soy and canola oil, cotton seeds, you Definitely don't want cottonseed oil in anything. And then, of course, Mm-mm. we're getting rid of sugar. And But we give everything. I don't believe in, in taking away. I think that denial and deprivation, deprivation don't work in the long term. So we give you replacements. So, yeah, you've got to get off the stuff. You've got to get off of sugar. But we'll say you can use coconut sugar or you can use dark liquid stevia so you can keep the sweetness but get rid of the sugar because mineral balance is so important for literally thousands Mm -hmm. of functions in the body and and sugar will deplete your minerals like nobody's business. Take it from a former sugar junkie. Like that is how I got into this field and it will deplete your hormones and it will kill your good gut bacteria. It is the white stuff. You know, a lot of researchers compare it, the molecular structure to cocaine as addictive as it is and the way it lights up the dopamine centers in the brain. And so GMO, sugar, alcohol, you know, you're going to want to knock it back considerably. If you drink as a regular as a regular thing, it's just a couple of drinks a week and it would be lower sugar and organic red wine or something like that. And it's, it's about crowding out, though, Nicole. And I know as a health coach and all, everything that you've done that you know that. And so it's like let's give mm-hmm. upgrades instead and let's start the day with um, hot lemon water first thing in the morning to clear out excess acid that you've collected in the joints overnight and give your body fresh enzymes so then you can have a good elimination of toxins. You know, that is such a simple thing and making sure that you're having two servings of organic leafy greens every single day. Very important to eat breakfast with healthy protein and fat within one hour of waking, especially in preconception, because that is your metabolic window for the day. What you do in the first hour of the day is going to set up basically your hormonal profile for the day. So we want to anchor you and kick metabolism, give you protein and fat so that way you can start to balance blood sugar because balanced blood sugar leads to balanced hormones and that's everything we need to make the body feel safe have a routine and know what to expect especially when we're baby making because you know ovulation having our period it's all about the routine and the body kind of functioning as a system it sure is wow that was some awesome advice thank you love that what about, sure. and speaking of advice for this, this time, what about labs? Are there, should people be getting tested? I mean, that's like one of the number one questions I get from women. Like, what tests should I do and how do I read these things? And where do I go from there if there's abnormal yeah. results? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so lab work is important, especially if you've tried to conceive, you know, for a few Mm -hmm. months, I'd say three to four months, and you haven't had success. We want to kind of do a little bit of digging. And in the book, we give an entire chapter dedicated to functional lab work. So like you, I'm all about finding the root cause of any type of issue. And there's a lot of lab work out there that doctors aren't running that I hope Mm -hmm. that they will. So I recommend a four-point cortisol panel where you're looking at cortisol and you're looking at DHEA and um, pregnenolone. These are precursor hormones from which the body can pull from and make sex hormones from there. So you never want to look at just your sex hormones like progesterone, 
um, estrogen, estrogen and testosterone because, and then, and band-aid with hormone replacement therapy when you're trying to get pregnant, because you want to go to the beginning where it starts, fill up the gas tank and let the body create its own hormonal balance from there. So I would recommend, I like saliva tests for hormones better than blood tests. I find that they're more accurate. There's no protein in saliva to be able to bind to them and throw off the results. And then, uh, um, my work for the last two years, in addition to the fertility and um, pregnancy, has been on gut and immune health, and they're inextricably connected. Like PCOS, I have found eight out of ten times starts with a parasite or a pathogen in the digestive system. And so that is one of the major causes and mainstream for infertility is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I can't even mm-hmm. count how many clients that I have run a stool panel on them. I do eight day stool panels. You can never find an eight day stool Whoa. panel. Most labs will only have, I am a hacker because I want to get to the root of it. So I have my clients, you know, put two samples from two different days in. So we're getting a better sample of the colon and we have a much greater chance of catching any pathogens that might exist there. And then we can combat those pathogens and get them out of the body, flip the genetic code of the gut. And when you do that, you change the hormonal structure. So wow, I would recommend <laughs> those to you. And I have one more, and I know I'm talking fast, but I just want to get the information out there because I know this is a short podcast, and I'm hoping that people <laughs> listening, if they've been struggling, they get a nugget, and it's like what moves the needle for them. Sure. Um, is looking for a genetic mutation. That's going to be really mm-hmm. important. I don't know how much you've talked about the MTHFR genetic mutation on your show. Have you talked about that? I'm not tons, not tons, but I talk about it so much in my programs and with my clients because I actually have one of those mutations, and, and it has led me down quite a path. It's kind of like heal or heal thyself, right? We have to prove the path, <laughs> and I've gotten so many things I've had to heal from so that I could then help others. So I commend you for taking it yeah. there. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yes, I would, if you wanted to share anything on that, that would be great because I feel like we haven't, we haven't covered it extensively on the podcast at all, really. Okay. So we have this genetic mutation, which now they're saying some 50% of the population has, it's abbreviated mm-hmm. MTHF. Are, and that's a mutation. And what that means is that you don't have the ability to convert basically folic acid into a usable form of folate. This is really important. Folate forms the neural tube and the spinal column. And when you can't do this, you have recurring miscarriages. If you've had even one miscarriage, you need to go to the doctor and ask them to test you for the MTHFR genetic mutation. And you must make sure all of your prenatals and the only form you are having is folate, which is a food-based form of folic acid, and that is processed in the digestive system. Problem is folic acid, which is man-made, is processed in the liver, and the liver just does not contain the enzymes to be able to break it down and actually use it. And so this is a problem in those with MTHFR genetic mutation. They have trouble detoxifying. Their liver can't detoxify the same way the people who don't have this have. And so they have a bit more trouble. And like to your point earlier, Nicole, it's like, yeah, even if you're only in your 20s, but you have this genetic mutation, you're, the liver is processing all the toxins of life. And if it can't process it, you know, as quickly as they're coming in, you're going to a backup, just like a five-car pileup on the freeway, right? It bottlenecks, it bottlenecks, yep. and problems really start to arise. And so this is really important. I had a client who came to me after five miscarriages. I mean, it's oh, devastating oh to a couple. It's oh. devastating to a family. She said, Chris, totally. I'm pregnant again, and I am so afraid to lose this child. And I said, I told her about this. She got tested and um, I think she was at the three month mark and she had it and we switched her right away. Even before she got tested, she was on the verge mm-hmm. of losing this child again. She had a large yolk sac, um, which means you're getting ready to lose the baby. 
And uh, we oh did an emergency. Uh, I had an acupuncturist that I teamed up with on my tougher cases. And I, he was getting ready to go on vacation. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I need you to turn around and go back to the office. And I'm sending her there. And he made her a concoction of Chinese herbs to prevent miscarriage in between that and changing <gasps> and praying long story short is we just got her birth announcement last week and she has a healthy beautiful baby girl and it's like this is the game changing stuff it's game changing in life of do you have this child or do you not and are they healthy and are they not and so it's an important topic to bring up the the mthfr genetic mutation oh my goodness i cannot agree with you more in in the book (laughs) Yeah, thank you. No, oh, we go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Sensitivity testing. That's the last okay. test I wanted. You know, in the book, we're going through a lot of them where you can kind of go through your own health history and say, okay, based upon my own health history, these are the labs I should run. But I also always recommend looking at a food sensitivity test and doing that maybe every three years to see which foods are your medicine and which foods are a slower form of poison, even if they're quote unquote healthy foods, they may not be right for your body right now. Oh my goodness, for sure. Um, what, how, where do you recommend people get food sensitivity testing? Because I feel like uh, just in my experience, there's not so much controversy around surrounding it, but there are some doctors believe in some tests, whereas others believe in others, and then some don't even believe in it. And, uh, and then there's accuracy issues and things like that. So I was curious what, uh, what you do. And, yeah and what you would recommend. Yeah, it's tough. You know, I'm not, um, I'm not in private practice anymore as of the last two years, but following it, I see all cat and spectra cell would be the two labs I would work with now yeah. um, for food sensitivity testing. And you're right. There's a lot of controversy. It's very political. Um, I mm-hmm. have a whole podcast in and of itself. I lost one of my main diagnostic <laughs> tools that was only, I mean, it was literally only $79 to determine 88 foods and it was super accurate. And that got taken away from this lab company. It was too easy to find information. And so, um, Wow. So then we started switching and I hadn't found one that I liked better because you, you have to know, are they standardizing the antigens that they're using? How do you know? Are they using, are you allergic to organic corn? Are you allergic to GMO corn? Are you allergic to chicken? Or are you actually sensitive to the corn and soy that the chicken consumed? Right. And so you have to know what the, the quality of the antigens are that these labs are using. And those two tests um, are the ones that I would trust right now would be SpectraCell and AllCat. Okay, that's good to know. Um, you had mentioned uh, testing before. You said something, and now I've forgotten because we just talked about so many others. So maybe I'll come back to that if I, have, if I remember what I was going to ask you. But uh, one of the other big questions is prenatal supplements and taking – oh, wait, mm-hmm. now, that I, now that I've mentioned that, I remember. So you mentioned folate, uh, especially for people – well, for everybody, but especially for MTHFR mm-hmm. people. But what about the methylated forms of folate – uh, and and B12. Well, how do you feel about the other types of of these B vitamins? Yeah, I like them all methylated in a prenatal mm-hmm. vitamin. And so, yeah, um, yeah, you want to look for methylfolate. You want to look for methylcobalamin. Those are going to be the two things that you want to see on the label. You want to have at least eighteen milligrams of iron. Um, you want to have, yeah, 18 of iron within your, your prenatal. And um, I can go ahead and just go ahead and tell you my three favorite brands of prenatal. Um, one is brand new. It's um, Orthomolecular's Prenatal Complete. It also has DHA. So that's super important for the baby's brain development. I don't know if you've heard of Innate, but they're kind of new and they're yeah. following our trimester because our trimester process. Like, for example, there's, you know, you need when the bones are forming, you need more calcium and vitamin D and um, phosphorus and uh, magnesium. When the skin is doing most of its forming, you got to really increase your vitamin C. Then you want to really, when the baby's blood volume is doubling and they're gaining weight quickly, you're going to be really focused on fats. Um, and so innate has per trimester multi uh, prenatal vitamins, which I think is really cool. Oh, that's so awesome. I didn't know that about them. So they're following your five trimester approach or is it more just the trimester approach in general? 
Yeah, I don't think they're following our our five trimester approach per se, but for when you, when you are in your actual first trimester, second and third, there the nutrients change and that matches our belief system where we have our first trimester's preconception and our fifth is postpartum, but for the three in right. between, I like that one. Mhm. Awesome. Yeah, or you can Yeah, I love your, your I love your five answer. trimesters. Sorry about that. Oh, I, I just totally it's, stepped all over you. What was that? <laughs> no, no problem. It's that I think that that five trimester approach is really is really important. It's important for mom to feel good as well. I, I mean, I'm curious what you thought of the placenta encapsulation aspect. Um, and if you're a fan of that, I mean, we've seen a night and day difference in the way mom feels and her milk supply and her energy levels and her ability to lose weight after the pregnancy by doing placenta encapsulation and postpartum. I'm just curious what you thought about that portion of the book. Oh, yeah, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I have good. tried to, yeah, totally. I mean, I basically am constantly trying to coerce every friend I know who's pregnant into doing this because how could you not? I mean, when, and I know there's not a lot of clinical evidence per se, but the anecdotal evidence for it is so incredible. I mean, the stories I've heard from women who've done placenta encapsulation just blow my mind. I mean, everything is better, every aspect of their health. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, then there definitely are studies between baby number one and baby number two in terms of how quickly your hormones oh. bounce back, whether you do it or not. And I've had, you know, it's a night and day difference for women. And I, I honestly almost feel like it's not an option, you know, if you're in your late 30s yeah. or early 40s because – you want to bounce back hormonally and you can have just as healthy of a pregnancy and postpartum period at that age as you could in your twenties. If you just use the tools that are available to you. Right. Agreed. I know. I agree completely. So tell me um, really quickly for uh, after getting pregnant, do you have any advice for women? Because I usually work with women to help them get pregnant and then, we, you know, and, and that's usually where it ends for the most part. So I'm curious if you had any, any little gems for, for women once they do finally cross that hurdle and they're able to get pregnant. Oh, absolutely. And that's what the, the whole second half of, of the book is about. It's like really important mm-hmm. when you first get pregnant. Um, we have different nutrients. Like so in the first trimester, you want to focus on hydration. You want to focus on high quality salt and you want to focus on protein and obviously when you're getting so much morning sickness and nausea and when you actually are hungry you have to have high mileage foods and and in the first trimester your high high mileage food is going to be high quality pasture raised animal protein and only you can fit in all the other foods around that but that is going to temper the hormonal surges um, that cause a lot of the nausea and it's going to help you to feel better and stronger and um, start to help develop the baby. And so you want to focus on those high folate foods in the first trimester because, like, as I said, the neural tube and spinal column, all that stuff is beginning to form. So you're going to be looking for Mm -hmm. things like lentils and asparagus and tomatoes and oranges and high folate foods there and, um, you know, amniotic fluids, basically salt and water, and that's going to be really important that you're going to stay hydrated and have enough electrolytes. So I would either do mm-hmm. an electrolyte drink, like the Good Anya Hydrate or Ultima Packets, or we have you kind of make your own with chia seeds and um, Himalayan pink salt, a little electrolyte powder, and then a good quality mineralized um, water. Those are going to be important and your leafy greens are going to be important. And then we start to move, like in the second trimester, you're going to feel much better if you have enough vitamin C. So we're going to really increase um, vitamin C and foods that are good for the kidneys. That's going to be really helpful if you're peeing all the time um, to, to strengthen those, those kidneys. And, um, you know, we get in foods like the highest foods in vitamin C are cauliflower, kiwis, uh, red organic, red bell peppers, and I love to put camu camu powder, which you can get in any health food store. It's just kind of sweet, sour tasting. I put that in my smoothie. 480 milligrams of vitamin C per teaspoon. You like it too? Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yes. It's an amazing superfood. Oh, it totally is. And you want to pump up the fish um, oil. Ah, uh, yes. Of course. That's a good one too. Mm-hmm. Anything else? 
around that? Well, I could keep going, but I know we're coming to the end of our, <laughs> our time. But we love to have bone broth. We love to have bone broth and um, good quality root vegetables. And we're big fans of high, high quality, you have to know the source, raw milk um, throughout pregnancy and grass-fed beef liver. And you can take the pills if eating liver disgusts you. Um, but those are all foods because you really want to make sure you're getting enough vitamin A and vitamin D. And this goes back to Weston A. Price and really that traditional diet. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a night and day difference to, to get enough of the fat-soluble vitamins through your food. Mm. That was excellent. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. I really hope that, like you said, the listeners take some really good things away from this. Um, Just so everyone knows, where can people find you and find your book, How to Conceive Naturally and Have a Healthy Pregnancy After 30? You can find it on Amazon or iBooks. It's in all Barnes and Nobles nationwide. And you can find all of my work at thewholejourney.com. Um, and if you go to how to conceive naturally.com, that's where you can enter your email and you get the whole, uh, first chapter, you get 43 pages of the book emailed to you to see if it's something that you would like. And that way you can fill out the assessment and see, okay, here's where I would start in my preconception detox. And you can have your partner, your husband, your partner, fill it out as well, because we have a dad chapter and it takes two to tango. So dad's got to do the cleanse too and prep that sperm. Awesome. That is a fact. Well, I can tell you, I can tell everyone listening that the first couple of the first chapter is incredible in this book. I mean, I took so much away from it and I believe you will too. So thank you so much, Krista, for being on here and sharing all of this really valuable information with our listeners. And I hope that you have an awesome rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. I hope you do too. All right. Thanks so much. Bye for now. Bye.